faith-based, community-driven streaming media. This is The Voice 17104.com from the Allison Hill District of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Now broadcasting community radio from Studio A and community television from Studio B on The Voice 17104.com. Welcome, my brothers and sisters, to the Richard James Show on 17104, The Voice. Greetings and salutations. Welcome, my friends, my family. Welcome to the Richard James Show. And today, I have an added blessing. You see, God has really, really taken care of Richard James. I don't know why he's been so good to me with some of the things that I've done. <laughs> Not too bad, though. But I've been really, really blessed to have an extremely talented family, a family that's conscientious, a family that's concerned about other people. And the individual of all of our family members that is most active in the community in every kind of way. And it's also probably the best known of all of my children and who is the youngest of the lot, Professor. You hear that? Professor Maria James Chow. Welcome, Maria, to the Richard James Show. Thanks, happy to be here. And I'm happy that you are here. Well, we have a show that we are going to deal with the life and legacy of Professor Child. Now, I will be re referring to her as Maria, as I always do, you know, and she can call me dad or whatever, whatever makes her more com 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 comfortable. Now, first of all, let's kind of start from, uh, uh, from the beginning. First of all, well, well, let me just say this, though, before we really get started. Uh, Maria is also published and has been published for, for, for a while. She's had a number of books, and she has some up things that are up and available now. Maria, can you tell us uh, what publications that you have, uh, their availability, and where people can, can, can obtain it? Okay, so I have published three books thus far. Um, Windows to the Soul, back in the last century, <laughs> I think 1999, and um, Rising Waters in 2003, and 2013 was Talking White. Um, yep, there it is. And uh, they, they're all poetry collections. And um, Talking White deals with uh, um, a lot of com community, like with interracial clashes that we have based on uh, differences uh, such as economic, uh, educational, and how we can clash against each other as African Americans. Um, my next book is entitled Rage Rage, and it, it kind of takes off of um, Dylan Thomas's poem, um, Rage Rage Against the Dying of the Light. And it is again a collection of poetry that is all about um, basically three things, but they all flowed into each other. One, dealing with chronic illness, um, dealing with the pandemic, as well as the chronic illness, and then dealing with both of those things as a Black woman and in the face of racial unrest. So um, that's Rage Rage, and um, I hope to be publishing it this year. I'm shopping it around for a uh, traditional small press uh, publisher. Now, are these books uh, available to the public? And if so, how can they be able to obtain one? Um, Talking White is available right now um, on Amazon. And um, just, uh, just put it in the search, um, Maria James Chow, T-H-I-A-W, and and you'll find it on Amazon. Rising Waters might be, um, but Windows to the Soul is out of print. So, so that might be on some website for $500, I don't know. 
Well, sometime I have books that have been on on Amazon for 20 years. And what happens is that sometimes they they collect uh, used copies and they sell them. And uh, the, the price can get really can get really okay. crazy. Oh, here we are. This this is the page. This this is it. This is what, yeah. what you would see if you go to Amazon. There's the price of the book, 1095. So mm -hmm. hey, Amazon is ready. Talking White is there and available. So folks, <laughs> you don't want to miss it. Uh, I don't know if you've heard the expression. Uh, I'm talking to the, to the audience. Uh, uh, people get, because they're educated and maybe uh, uh, enjoy the King's English. And then people uh, will say to them, oh man, you talking like a white guy. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't understand what you're saying. Yeah, uh, speak, speak Ebonics, please, so I can understand what you're saying. So she's capsulized and, and, and put it out there. It's a wonderful, I've read the book. The book is outstanding. The poetry is outstanding. It's just a wonderful, 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 wonderful book. Uh, now, uh, uh, re, uh, do, 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 go ahead. I, I was going to say, if they don't want to take your word for it, they can read the reviews on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> You have it, you don't have anything with you from talking white, do you? Um it, the room. <laughs> I think I think I might. Let me see. Let's see, let's see. I have a little poetry folder here. Um I think this one is, yeah. This is this one is um i believe this one's in talking white it's called mad poet um it's in dedication to um to all of the poets that across the world have been persecuted for their poetry uh poetry that has spoken too much truth so mad poet I call your stone. One day you'll look and find I'm gone. That was a quote from the Afghani female poet, Rahila Muska. To fade from Taliban gaze, Zarmina, the forbidden girl poet, morphed into Muska, a smile, a grin without a girl playing with honey-coated love words in the dark. She shared with sisters by phone, her voice like her hair covered for her protection. How fine she looked dressed in rage, red eyes suit so few. But once unveiled her words revealed her truth. Smile met her brother's fists, drank the liberty of Lovelace then melted under self-set flames her protest against mad men. Words resonate in the fire's crackle. We're all mad here. I'm mad, you're mad. You and I, poet, let us write revolution in flame. Wow, wow, that is fantastic. That was you project real... so well. Thank you. You're that was, that, that was a story I had read about this uh, the women in Afghanistan not being allowed to write poetry and but it was part of their heritage and tradition to write what's called landlays and um, this particular girl Zermina who um, used the name Rahila Muska on the radio when she read her poetry she tried to disguise her voice but her family found out and um, they hurt her badly put her in the hospital and then in protest, she set herself on fire. Oh so, my God. Yeah. That is awful. That is awful. That's awful. And it's so meaningful. The one thing I love about your poetry that it touches uh, your, your inner core. It touches who you are and wh where you are. Uh, it's very, very, very meaningful. Very meaningful. Let me just sort of step back for a minute and give folks a little background. Now, you're not well known publicly here in the Harrisburg area and, and you're known in, in other areas. Uh, and thank God this program goes internationally. 
Uh, so people all over the world will be listening to Maria James. But my question is that let's get into some of your background. I certainly know your parents. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about uh, your education and, 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 and how your interest in poetry. Why, why poetry? What, what is it? What, what, what captured you and drove you that way? And give them a little bit about your educational background because it's, it's, it's phenomenal, it's wonderful. I um, honestly, I think it was the influence of, of seeing you write and read poetry that started me off on that path that I really knew I was gonna write poetry before I knew how to write. Um, <laughs> I was recently writing a poem about that too, about that experience of watching you recite poetry. Um, yeah. It's not done yet though. <laughs> but but yeah, that was that was that was a great influence. And it, it's it's funny now I've seen a lot of um, PKs, poets kids that have been at the events and things like that and um, are now writing because of that influence is really important. Um, one in particular that's in my class, I'm sure would not like to be mentioned. So <laughs> they would be very shy. But um, I do think it's important um, seeing the parent embrace the arts and it can really influence what we do. So that's what started me off. And then I got a lot of encouragement in school, um, started winning poetry contests at seven, uh, made, made a little book in class uh, and it, it won a contest and became part of the collection of South Pacific that. Library. I so you have a copy of that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure <laughs> one of the few copies around. <laughs> um, little, little poems for little people. So I didn't mention that one at first because it was like, three copies, but <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that was really encouraging. And then um, I stopped in middle school, but then in high school picked it up again. So then in college, I had some great professors that encouraged me to, uh, to write as well. And then once I learned graphic design, from the wonderful Al, Professor Al Mason at Shippensburg University. Uh, then I started designing my first official uh, poetry chapbook, and that was Windows to the Soul. And it was published by Shippensburg University Press um, about, I think, was it 98 or 99 that it came out? Something okay. like that. Might have been somewhere around there. <laughs> and, um, and then I stayed at SHIP for grad school, left a little while, worked a bit, came back, finished, and then um, started working at Central Penn College. And then um, they helped pay for grad school. And since poetry was so important in my life, it was so much um, a part of what was really important to me, I realized that um, that's what I wanted to focus on. That I didn't have to be something else and keep it on the side necessarily. So I, um, I went back for a master's in fine arts in poetry. And yeah. I started, I, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say I started at Rosemont College and which is a wonderful college. And I was just there, um, not physically there, but Zoom fully there uh, for their Lit Life Festival yesterday. Had a wonderful time with them. Um, but because of the commute, you know, before Zoom was created, then I, I transferred. <laughs> so I graduated from Goddard College. One of the finest schools in the nation. Yes, yes, definitely. Fine schools in the nation. Uh, and, and tell us where you are now and what, what you're doing. So I am the, um, the teacher of creative writing. I'm uh, 
the program coordinator. I am, I get to, I get to establish how my program will reach its goals and reach the right students. I get to audition students and pick them for the program. Um, I'm thrilled. It's a dream job. The, the yeah. yeah, it's a nice, small, intimate uh, group. We focus on the arts, but they also get an excellent academic education as well. And um, it's great to see them grow and thrive. And I have ninth through 12th grade. Fantastic, fantastic. Can you tell us something about the plays that you've written and that you've had performed? I mean, mm. you're a tremendous, not only a poet, but you're a tremendous playwright. And that, that's a, a sort of a, they combine, but it's kind of a different skill, you know, in terms of organization and presentation. Tell us about your plays. Okay, so uh, Reclaiming My Time was first performed in 2018 at the Capital Area, um, at the Capital <laughs> Blue Cross, <laughs> Capital Blue Cross Theater. There's a picture. Yeah, this is a picture. Two of our wonderful actresses, um, Ashanti Conover and Morgan Littleford, they were both students at Central Penn College at the time and um, just really great talents. And this is, uh, this is a great scene because um, uh, Miss Brunson here is just so um, full of life and just an amazing wow. actress and gorgeous. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we have yes, both students is. and community um, actors there. Um, Tierra is uh, in the background with the, with the gray hoodie and she was a Central Penn student. And then Sydney is a community actor and she has a background in uh, musical theater. Tremendous voice, just gorgeous. We've got Kirsten um, Hyman, who uh, people in the community might've seen in plays for um, Christian Life Assembly. Um, many times she's just really talented um, performer. We had 12 actresses in the show. There's the crew. <laughs> and it was directed by Janet Bixler. And it was... Um, wow, that's good. Yeah. It's, and we had a nice, um, just a wonderful group of women there. And basically the show just, it sold out every show and it is a choreo poem like in the tradition of Intozaki Shange okay. um, yeah it's a, there was about 29 poems and they were put together in such a way to tell a story and the the thread going through it is that story of um, overcoming uh, systematic racism it, it's definitely the, and, and the challenges and sexism as well, because uh, it was based on women's stories. So these are right. all real oral histories. Absolutely wonderful. One thing that I've noticed with your, with, with your poetry, that it sends a clear and potent message on issues that are important to people. Uh, and you partic have a particular concern with the treatment of women. We know that in society, that the glass still is still there. Know that barriers still exist when it comes to women, and 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 it's particularly and especially African American women. And you seem to uh, have embraced the cause to turn down some of those bar bar barriers. Is, is that correct? A correct interpretation? Yeah. That's that's a really good interpretation because where everybody has their area that, um, that they're most effective in and you know, someone is going to be really equipped to be um, out there marching and organizing. And that, I think that's fantastic, but I can't fool myself. I know that with my, my issues that I have, um, 
I, I could not, you know, take on that role necessarily. Right. Right. But my sword is my pen. And I definitely can create awareness and understanding and speak out um, through my through my art. And it's, it's not even necessarily a, a conscious thing. But it's just within me, I could. Wow. Not, yeah, I could decide that I'm going to write about butterflies and the poem becomes about multiculturalism. So <laughs> it's yeah. just yeah. how it is. Yeah. And the important thing is that what you're doing is affecting the lives of others. Uh, I am concerned, and I know you are, that young women, just like young men, particularly young African-American women, need to feel good about who they are. Mm -hmm. need to feel good about their talents and skills. And looking at Maria James Chow uh, perform, and you could you tell us some of the places that you have performed? Because you have performed and you have made a difference when it comes to young women. And believe it or not, when it comes to young men, they've also been affected in a positive way with the kind mm -hmm. of things that you're doing and the kind of things that you're saying and dealing with issues. Thank you. I've I've definitely I I'm pretty sure I've performed at all of the venues in Pennsylvania in in at least like the at least central to eastern Pennsylvania. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not not as much in western Pennsylvania. So Pittsburgh, holler at me. But <laughs> but um, definitely all over Pennsylvania. Um, New York, Florida, Tennessee, Washington, like um, many different states. And then um, I had the honor to study poetry under Marilyn Callett um, through VCCA France and go to Ovalar, which is a beautiful little town in the south of France. And there I performed and I, and I got to go there twice, 2011 and 2015. Well, that is fantastic. Now, Maria, you might kill me for this, but I'm going to have to ask anyway. You do a, you do a, a song that deep down touches your soul. It's called Strange Fruit. <laughs> One that was done uh, many, many years ago. Hey, could you just, could you hear just a couple of notes? <laughs> Not kill me for asking because I didn't say anything in the beginning about strange <laughs> fruit, but I mean, can you just just a okay. couple of notes? <laughs> <laughs> now I'm not I'm not Andrew Day or Billy Holiday, but I'll do my best. <laughs> um, uh, southern trees bear a strange. Blood at the leaves and blood at the root. Black body swinging in the southern breeze. There is strange. Fruit hanging from the poplar tree. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I know I sprung that on you, but <laughs> sure. the thing <about> is that <laughs> song has tremendous meaning, and I've seen you perform that song and does such a wonderful job. But some individuals understand that hundreds and hundreds of African-Americans were hung in this uh, society, particularly around the, uh, the, the beginning of the century and, before, and prior to that, uh, and they're still being hung. Uh, we have a documentary that's being shown on CNN now uh, about a woman who sued the Ku Klux Klan and won, which is a rarity because our, our people are really catching it. Uh, there's a organization, Maria. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed a sign in your yard 
that says Black Lives Matter. Can you explain your position on Black Lives Matter and what um, they're trying to do? Black Lives Matter isn't just an organization, it's a fact. And it does not mean, and it's a shame that we have to qualify our statement to people that can't seem to understand the reality, <laughs> but it does not mean that white lives don't matter. It doesn't mean that Asian lives don't matter. It doesn't mean it's not about you. Like, that's what I would say to those folks that are just so up in arms about it. It's not about you. For once, there's something not about you. What we want to talk about right now is us because of a hundred years of lynching, a hundred years of Jim Crow, of police brutality, 1619. We want to talk, all that stuff is real. And so for a moment, let's not talk about you. And so we say Black Lives Matter too. Right? So I'm very concerned. I am a mother of two black boys yes. um, in the United States, in central Pennsylvania. I know the history, I know the dangers. And so I want to make sure that everybody knows, and there yeah. they are, <laughs> that their lives matter. So tell who those boys are, huh? They don't know. Yep. The little one uh, is Bobby. Baba Car Chow. <laughs> and um, he is now, that's an older picture, but now he's seven. He just turned seven last week. And there's his big brother, Mohammed, who is now um, 11. And he's glaring at me because he's like, You had that picture? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we well they know certainly that are. Yeah, we need them to know like they are valued and um, and that they are loved and they are precious and also that the world is dangerous and they need to be careful. And, you know, that it, it's sad that so many um, people have done everything right. Put your hands on the wheel, be polite, duh, 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 and um, still end up getting hurt. Yeah. So... Well. I had to ask because your poetry is art uh, and it's awful and that in itself is important. But what's also important is the message that, uh, the message that sends that deals with everyday confront people and human beings, uh, whether they be African-American, whether they be white females, whether they be Asian-Americans. Uh, Asian-Americans have have taken a blow and they're being attacked all over the country. There was a man called Trump blamed China uh, for this so-called epidemic. So it's important that people of goodwill and good sense make sure we keep people safe and you don't do it by staying ignorant. And individuals like yourself that tell it like it is and, uh, and put an eye on what's going on in this world. Uh, helps to keep people safe. You don't be safe, ignorant. And so that's why I just had to say it because I know that you take a very, very personal stand when people are treated wrong. Uh, we're having issues with the police all over the country because of the kind of training that they receive and the kind of attitudes and the criminal justice system has supported bad policing. And not all police are bad. I know some of the best individuals I know who happen to be police, but I also have met some dogs and have been in contact with some of those things. Now, I married a very wonderful, intelligent lady who has a lot in common with you uh, in terms of her activism, in terms of her interest in, in social welfare. And you also have written a Poem. I don't know if <laughs> I'm asking too much uh, that about some of the areas. She was in what they known as a domestic uh, peace corps years and years ago and put her life on the line with some of the things that you're doing. And uh, you wrote a poem that I, you know, I didn't even know about the incident 
but to hear the poetry that you put together just kind of blew me away. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, that lady I'm talking about that I know and love it is Maria's mother. You know, <laughs> Mary, Mary. Can you share James. that that picture with uh, me, her, and Janet? We have that picture. Okay. And before I'm pull, I'm pulling that poem out that you're referring to. There yes. it is. <laughs> yes, we were at a great women's conference that day, and. All right. <laughs> and and uh, the lady in the middle is the director of my play, Reclaiming My Time. That's Janet Bixler. And um, we were at a women's conference because we were getting the, ready to start a great business, Reclaim, Reclaim Artists Collective, which people can check out on reclaimartistscollective.org. But we are... Um, Taking, taking those plays and into schools, into other organizations so that they can be shared with young people. Speaking of young people, I have to remind them that I told them to go play outside because I'm on the internet. <laughs> okay, so there's, oh, oh, there's one thing else as you were speaking about Black Lives Matter that I wanted to add um, is that I recently learned that for one thing, a lot of the people of color that have been killed by police also had a mental disorder. And um, right. part of the thing people are talking about when they're talking about defund the police, they're talking about changing the system so that like instead of police coming for a mental health um, episode, actual professionals in mental health come for that episode. And, and so something I learned just a couple days ago was that when police come and deal with someone for a mental health episode, whatever it is, in their system, in their computers, they cannot, there is no place to put that this was an autism episode. This was, this person's bipolar, this person. There's no way to say what this person's issue is so that the next time police come, they would know, okay, we need to deescalate this or we need to call the social worker or we need, you know, they, they have no way of knowing. So I would I want to say right now to to Lower Allen Township police that that is something that needs to be changed because um, they don't want to be the next ones on the news. So <laughs> I wanted to share that. Yeah. So we're talking about targeting funds uh, for the uh, issue and that kind of thing. Not talking about completely running away from the police. But we're talking about when it comes to the services that are received and who's better capable of doing it that you know we target funds in that direction. That makes a lot of sense to me. I agree with that. That's, that's for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to share uh, from reclaiming my time um, the story, the poem of uh, that I wrote based on my mother's story and. Mom had so much, it was, it's interesting because for a long time, she didn't say anything about her no. activism. And then when I finally did interview her um, as part of the oral history uh, for Reclaiming My Time, I was amazed by the things that she has been through. And I learned so much about her and about the movement and, and everything. And I don't know if we said this, but she was in Louisiana and um, with VISTA, the Domestic Peace Corps. And they started the um, first integrated daycare center in the state of Louisiana. Wow. So of course the 
plan didn't like that too much. So I'm just pulling that up right here. Just a moment. Okay. Interesting that she was also involved in education. Uh, they care is one thing, but also involved in, in teaching those kids and making them feel good about who they are in one of the most racist states uh, in the union. Uh, they don't get much worse than Louisiana and uh, yeah. and, and, and Baton Rouge is the capital of the state of Louisiana and they have a horrible reputation in terms of their treatment of, of black folks. And I know that she went through some horrible things there. And I yeah. love your interview because uh, sometimes she'll keep those things inside herself but she opened up with that and it just kind of blew me away. We've been married for a long, long, long time. And I didn't know some of the stuff that, that she's gone through. I knew some of it because when I met your mother and I won't go too well, she was uh, an intern uh, and she was working in the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, and that's how uh, that's how we got to know each other. That's not how we met, but that's how we got to know each other. So mm -hmm. then she got into this right. So she always in her life has been concerned about other people. Mm -hmm. Well. The poem that I wrote based on her story is called The Trunk. Okay. I had to leave New Orleans in the trunk of a car after days of poking at Jim Crow. They called us zip dandy, agitators, Yankees, reported our checkerboard groove fest in the hotel, blacks and whites harmonizing like piano keys. It was Fat Tuesday in the Big Easy, but there's nothing easy about civil rights work. So I had to leave New Orleans in the trunk of a car. My high ho silver moment wasn't like the ones on TV. The Impala pulled up and legs swung over wrought iron balcony, thrown like Mardi Gras beads into a blanket of blackness. The growl of the engine, the bump, bump, boom of the rocky ground, the hollow hum of the radio ran over the hoot and holler clan on our tails. I was knocked around but safe, tucked away in the Impala's arms. I had to leave New Orleans in the trunk of a car because my last ride left its footprint on my psyche. I was the passenger, my white friend driving. The fuzz pulled him out the window, beat him bloody, called him kike and kick, kick, kicked him, pulled oh. our pixie haired friend from the back, beat her for looking like a boy, made me watch and learn why a Negro should never take a front seat. I had to leave New Orleans in the trunk of a car. Wow, that is fantastic. That is a wonderful portrayal of what actually happened uh, when your mother's involvement. And I just think it's wonderful. And they say that the leaf doesn't fall very far from the tree. Let's yeah. hope that you don't have to leave, can't feel from the trunk of a car, but. <laughs> <laughs> Those times, but <laughs> but also, but you, uh, but you have the uh, wisdom and the interest in dealing with other people, and, and some of the things cross in education. Your mother also, you know, we had a degree in psychology, but she also uh, is concerned about things like Black Lives Matter. She heads up; she's the president of Link, mm -hmm. which a major, major social organization that she works in, so, so much for that, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, and, yeah, and the Harrisburg PA chapter of the Lynx Incorporated has been a great supporter of my work as well, and I really am grateful to really? all those That's things. Great. Yeah, now you're setting up an org a private organization to do some, some things, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, Reclaim Artists Collective is, um, and I think more light. Yeah. Reclaim Artists Collective um, is an organization uh, I created with Janet Bixler, and we have a wonderful uh, board, and we are working towards getting our 501c3. And um, we are focused on 
creating uh, affordable programming for those in marginalized communities and helping to raise the consciousness of people about social justice issues. Um, and that's exactly what uh, Reclaiming My Time, the choreo poem has done for people. We had, um, we've had, right, you. yeah, there's, there's my partner in crime and me at our first board meeting right before the, the world turned upside down. And um, we, we are just, we have a lot of great things we're doing. We, we have, we thought at first that everything would be frozen because of the pandemic, but um, one of our actors, uh, Adrienne Thoman, she was like, girls, I don't care. Your actors want to do this thing, so let's do it. You know, there's technology. So, um, we are able to shift the mindset and take Reclaiming My Time from the theater to Zoom. Same, and, collective. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's our logo. And we did a Zoom production of Reclaiming My Time. It was a little shorter. We had to think differently um, instead of, we couldn't all be in the same room and we were in different boxes, but because of, um, Janet's brilliant. She figured out how to make it look so uniform across all of those, um, every actress in her own home um, and still be just as powerful a uh, performance. And so we did that in December, it went really well. And then we showed it again for the Journey Church and the Methodist Conference um, in February. And it's just been a really good, good experience. Um, for the future, we want to create more choreo poems. We have students at CASA uh, working on our hair story, which is a show about um, the hair. You wouldn't think of how important hair is to African-American women, but it really is central. And it has been used to, to lock us out of certain opportunities. So um, the students have gone and done interviews with people in their lives. And this? yes, this is the beautiful Akaya. Um, she, Simpson, she's in my uh, senior class and she was acting out one of the hair stories. Um, and this is Kelly, she's a theater student at CASA and she put together a whole a whole thing <laughs> for um, for one of the poems involving shaving cream and other hair products and everything, kind of demonstrating how um, how icky some of the things are. And this is Janet Bixler making the magic happen. You didn't know that your director needs a magic wand. Well, actually, that's a mirror, but it looks like a magic wand in that picture. <laughs> So we, we had a great time. There's Najuma. Some folks might have seen her in the state's um, Black history program, along with uh, Sankofa. But uh, Najuma's a great theater student as well. And they're putting together those hair, hair stories. So we hope to um, take, take, take that show further. Oh, and this is my coworker, uh, Robert Campbell. And he was uh, taping some of the activities and things we were doing with the students. And this is Chloe. She's a great poet. She's a great poet in my 12th grade class. And so they were doing different kinds of um, activities with the hair products and things like that to think, to devise ways to demonstrate the poetry that, they, that they'd written. And we call that the American Grio Project residency because the Grios, right. yeah, the Grios are the people that are telling us their story. And uh, we spend time with a school group to teach them how to do the oral history, how to write the poetry, how to perform the poetry, and how to make their own production whether it's on Zoom or in the future on stage at their schools. So that's something, one of the things that the Reclaim Artist Collective does. Okay, was this your idea, this collective idea? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I, after reclaiming my time was so successful and so many people encouraged me to keep it going. Um, we started thinking, I started thinking, how can we do this? And um, Janet and I put our heads together and, and thought maybe with the nonprofit, we can uh, get the funding we need to take the show on the road to do more programs. I was already interested in doing workshops, um, teaching creative writing in the community, and it just seemed like a real natural fit. Okay, yeah. my time, proclaim artists, proclaim my time, journey, United Methodist Church. So yep. is this, what is this now? Is this how they can get in touch with you? No, that, that one was um, our December 3rd, uh, RMT 2.0, our, our Zoom uh, version of Reclaiming My Time that we did for the Journey Church, which is where I go to church with um, uh, Pastor Chris Sledge. He welcomed us to um, do a screening of RMT 2.0 for the church and the Methodist, um, the other Methodist churches in the area. And opened up the gates for a discussion about anti-racism and um, Black Lives Matter and, and all these social justice issues. So we did a talk back after the show, which featured, in which Pastor Chris interviewed myself, Joyce Davis, and Todd Allen, um, who is in charge of um, diversity at Messiah University. Joyce Davis, who is Joyce Davis? Joyce Davis is an amazing uh, international um, journalist, and she she also works for Penn Live. She writes for Penn Live, and she does um, programs for Penn Live. And she started the Harrisburg World Affairs Council. So, did she also work in the mayor's office at one point? Oh yeah, she she did work for Mayor Linda Thompson as communications director. One of the few people <laughs> that that did. She might have been the first one. There were a few. Yes, quite a. She's well known. She is. Quite, that's why I mentioned. Yeah, yeah she's. She's, she's well, like her skills are unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Yep, she's a great person. Now, let me ask you uh, in terms of your collective: Is there any needs that uh, a public can supply? Do you need volunteers for anything? Are you in need of any kind of funding? Uh, uh, if so, uh, how can people help to help you to 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 give get, get you those needs, whether it's volunteer funding or what, whatever? What is it that you need? Where where are you in terms of your organization? People can sign up um, to be a volunteer or um, get in touch with us at Reclaim Artist Collective dot org and um there if they want to give a donation or something they could they could do that on there um we are between fiscal sponsors at the moment and sending in uh paperwork for the 501c3 so but it it yeah. might be it might be a maybe a month before we can <laughs> accept donation um but soon we will be able to Okay. Again, and then there's our address um, and information right there. Um, so again, it's reclaimartistcollective.org. And they can learn more about the American Grio Project there and um, see pictures from our shows. We've also done um, Bridge, the Cap Bridge the Gap in conjunction with um, Sankofa, African American Theater Company. And um, we're working on Loving in Black and White, which is what is this? Uh, th this right here. This is um, pictures from Reclaiming My Time. These are some. There, some of them are rehearsal pictures, and then some are from the show. Okay, beautiful, fantastic. All right. So there are opportunities for those who want to participate and want to help and be supportive of what you're doing to do that. And the information information is there. You're putting it yeah, out there. And, 
And I would say actors as well. If you're in the Harrisburg community or surrounding areas and you're interested, interested in opportunities um, to act, you know, get in touch with us. Info at reclaimarts.org. Um, oh, this is uh, one of my actors, Kirsten Hyman, who I mentioned earlier with Dr. Eleanor Moody Shepherd, who was who spoke at our one of, our, I think it was our last show of Reclaiming My Time. Um, she's amazing. Dr. Moody Shepard, uh, she has done so much. She was a friend of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. She helped to get the word out about the bus boycott. She also told us this incredible story of an older person in her life who told her the story of the first Juneteenth. Right. The first, that she was there as a little girl and saw when the Union troops came to tell them that the war had been over for six months and that they were free. So it, it's, I just love how we can pass these stories down. And it's just, she was an incredible person to, to meet. There's nothing more important than, than getting the message out and telling the truth. Uh, we are blessed in the James family. Uh, to have a African-American museum, uh, Memorial Museum, James Jack Hatley in Thomasville, Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, which projects this. But what you're doing is of equal importance. I mean, my goodness, you got a living museum where you're sharing information and ch sharing projects and also giving people the opportunity to participate and do, so do something themselves, not just to read a book, but to put that book in action. Congratulations, my daughter. You're doing a Thank wonderful you. job in many, 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 many ways. Uh, One of the yeah. greatest uh, compliments I felt that I received, and it, I and I heard it multiple times from young men and 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 boys, is I had no idea that women went through that. I need to call my grandmother. That that was amazing because. That, that's what it's about. Talk to your elders, find out like what, where they've been, um, all they had to overcome to get you here. You know, it's, it's really important. Sometimes it's not just what happens, it's how you interpret what happens. Many of us have seen certain things and it's passed us by. But what you're doing is helping us to understand what is going on. Some of these young men have seen women discriminated against. Some of these young men have discriminated against young women themselves because there were things that were taught to us as young men. A uh, male has, the man has to be head of the house. Uh, you know, certain occupations are for men. Um, women can't be engineers. They can't be firefighters. They can't be uh, this and they can't be that. Uh, they can't be doctors. They'll have to be nurses. Uh, but to show an example and then also to uh, zero in on what is real. And that's is what you're doing and you're a living example of what is real. I think it's fantastic. I think it's wonderful. I think it's highly, highly necessary. Thank you. And what you're doing is not just affecting your current uh, generation. It's affecting generations to come. And we were not put on this earth to live forever. There's a, there, there, there's a, a thing that will uh, take us away from this world at some point. But you planted the seeds. You planted the seeds of equal opportunity, uh, gender opp opportunity, respect and caring for people. And thank you so much for doing that. It just does my heart good to see that this is happening and this is going on. Thank you. Well, speaking of generations, I, I'm, I have a poem um, called Opening the Gates that kind of came out of my um, looking into Ancestry.com and looking into all the, the uh, generations that came before me, before you. I, I just think, I find it fascinating to find out you know, from these different documents, who people, who people are. Okay, let's let's <laughs> hear it. Are. We're down at the end of the show. Let's let's hear that. You're going to recite that poem. Sure. Good. Mm -hmm. Please. 
So good night, right near the end, and I really want to look forward to hearing it. Take care. Okay. It's called Opening the Gates. The ebony clock tick tocks to the rhythm of my great grandfather's feet as he still saunters high headed down Spring Hill Road in Georgia. Only the gifted can see him now when he slips into the rhythm of his past life and winks at honey honey ladies leaving church, imagining the red heat rising in their cheeks, the twinkle in their mahogany eyes, or when the night rolls in and he lurks in trenches along the road's edge, armed, ready, imagining his neighbors beside him waiting for clan to ride by. His memories replay as dead memories do when specters hang around long after the clock has chimed. That time halting musical signal of the end. Now the ebony clock tick tocks to and fro to the rhythm of his feet and he peers deep into the light he's been avoiding. He sees folk getting ready. He sees folk making room. A revelry in the heavens, iron gates unchained. They're about to open up. Ain't been preparations like this since the world was at war, he thinks. An influx is coming. My great granddaddy waits in the trench he dug decades ago, knowing the ebony clock's tick tock will stop its dull, heavy, monotonous clang and release a chime from its brazen lungs. All will be still then, as a parade of Georgians march towards glory. If he sees his kin on their way to the light, he'll take their hand and tell them, I didn't want to leave the red clay. Couldn't stand to say goodbye, just mumble the lie and jump the train, taking my last look at Georgia. <laughs> the Klan done run me out for shooting them off their horses. I didn't know there was police and politicians under them robes. Men with the power to break up families. Hateful heartless, treating black lives like trash. He would take their hand and make them understand I had to go north, had to shelter in place to protect y'all from the plague of hate back home. He quarantined in Detroit, planning to return when things had changed, when the demons were amassed and the pathogen of racism had stopped spreading in the land of his birth, but he died alone of pneumonia in the palm of a neglectful healthcare system. He returned as a specter waiting for his shame to let him cross over. But how could great grands understand my world, he thought. A world where Negro lives mean nothing, where health care is unequal, where politicians lie to protect profits over people. They can't forget me. Forgive me, he figured. They can't understand. The ebony clock tick tocks to and fro to the rhythm of my great grandfather's feet as he walks away from the light once again. Head hung low, he hunkers down, stiff frozen as a dream deferred in the trench he dug decades past along spring, alongside Spring Hill Road in Georgia. That is absolutely outstanding. That's Thanks. the first time I've had the opportunity to hear that poem about my grandfather, uh, Richard C. Jenks the first. Uh, you capture lots of things that have been passed down by the family. My uncle Johnny, who was the oldest, who tells the story about how my grandfather fighting the Klan you did a wonderful, wonderful job. And I want to say, keep on, keeping on. I love you dearly. Uh, your mother and I really appreciate you. And I want you to continue. This is the end of the Richard James Show. And you have heard the renowned, well-known, well-loved, well-thought of Maria James Chow, uh, putting it out there for the world to see. Uh, I want you to look at our broadcast. Uh, this uh, is, of course, being done live. It also will be repeated itself. And uh, on my Tuesday broadcast, we will re, uh, rebroadcast this whole uh, segment. Uh, also, you'll be able to watch it on YouTube. So 
This is wonderful. Maria, keep up, keep up the good work. And, uh, and may heaven smile upon you and be gracious unto you. And I want to thank the Chris Thomas and his wonderful wife uh, for creating the opportunity for us to do this. So I'm going to say so long and much love to you and to yours. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you again for tuning in to James Show, our African American program. I'm set up to educate you on what's going on in this world. We thank you for taking out the time to listen. Let's hear from you sometime also. So, this is your neighbor and your friend signing off. And so, I'll see you again next week and hear from you again next week. So long. God bless.